Well, hello, lovelies. I'm going to show you some very simple, inexpensive tools of the trade you can use that will go a long way towards helping you prevent ever having a heart attack or a stroke or even developing a chronic illness. So let's get started. Just a few simple items, and I'm going to show you what it means. And disclaimer right off the bat, I'm not a doctor. I'm a lay person. I know a lot for a lay person. I'm I know a lot, and I'm always happy to share stuff with other people where I can help them out. So having said that, do your due diligence. Check with your doctor if you have any concerns whatsoever. I'm not going to give you anything to undermine any medical advice that you might be getting from your doctor. Okay? So having said that, let's continue. I believe every household should have something that takes blood pressure. Super important. So with the blood pressure machine, what it's going to show you and why it is so important to show you what it's going to show you is because you want to know about the pressure that's being exerted upon your arterial vessels, as well as when your heart isn't beating versus when it is beating. Your heart's always beating, obviously, but there's that space between the heartbeats where there's also pressure. So the reading is going to give you a systolic pressure on the top and a diastolic pressure on the bottom. These are typically also going to show you whatever your heart rate is as well. I'll get into that in a moment. But the top number, so the healthy number you want to go for is 120 over 80 or something a little bit less. And if it's over that, then you start getting into prehypertension, then hypertension, and before you know it, you're on blood pressure medications, and then side effects of that will cause you to need other medications, and before you know it, it just spirals downhill. And you're on one of those pill bottles that has like Monday through Sunday or whatever, and you're on dozens of medications as you get older. And then all those medications have their own side effects and really taxes your whole body. It's harder to live a joyous life like that. And then you pass away before you had to, and maybe your mobility is chipped away way before it should be. So <laughs> have one of these. The systolic reading, the number on top, the 120 over 80, we'll use that for example. Uh, this is uh, millimeters of mercury. So what the top number is measuring is the amount of pressure against your blood vessels during the actual heartbeat. The bottom number, your systolic pressure, is measuring the pressure against your vessels between heartbeats. So that moment between heartbeats is super important because that's when your heart is actually nourishing itself. So that's going to get into my next thing. For the next thing, you don't even need to go out and buy anything. You can just take your pulse, measure your heart rate. Your resting heart rate is going to be ideal. So the best time to do your resting heart rate isn't so much when you're resting like I am right now. I'm just sitting here resting. But it's when you wake up first thing in the morning. Before you even get out of bed, that's when it's going to be best to measure your resting heart rate because it's going to be at its lowest during that time. So just two fingers along your carotid artery. I use my middle and index. I can get it pretty easily, especially if I tilt my head just a little. And don't apply a lot of pressure. Otherwise, that might put uh, more strain on your um on your heartbeat to maybe make it beat a little faster. So just a light pressure, just enough to feel it, and I can feel it right away. Or you can take it right here. For me personally, I have to grip it like this, but not hard, and then I can feel it. Some people can take it here, but for most people, myself included, just like this as I'm laying there in bed. And I'll look at my watch, I'll count, you know, 10 seconds, I'll count how many beats in that 10 seconds. I'll multiply by uh, six for 60 seconds. And then I got my resting heart rate beat per minute. You can also do 15 seconds, then multiply by four. Same thing, 30 seconds, multiply by two. You don't want to go lower than 10 seconds because then it's not going to be accurate enough. So like if you do six seconds, then multiply by 10. Um, well, you might be between heartbeats. You might be closer to the heartbeat that's just about to come or closer to the heartbeat that you just had. And then when you multiply that by 10, you could be inaccurate by as much as five heartbeats per minute versus 10 seconds, which is the lowest I recommend. You might be off by two, maybe three heartbeats, but that's not really significant enough, especially for this purpose. And of course, the most accurate way, if you want to, just hold it for a full one minute and you can do that. But I typically do the 10 seconds. So with your resting heart rate, ideally you want to be 50s, maybe 60s. If it's more than that, if it starts getting into the 70s, I would say even upper 60s. It's starting, it's getting too high. 70s, certainly on the high side. If it goes beyond the 70s, that's tachycardia, especially 80s, 90s. Tachy means it's abnormally fast. The opposite of that is bradycardia, which is abnormally slow. So 
here's a little really cool, interesting caveat. You can have a resting heart rate that's in the 40s, but only if you're really fit, like you work out hard anaerobically, and then you drive it down. Uh, now, if you have a resting heart rate that's in the 40s, but you're not healthy, you're not fit, and you're pretty much you know, living a sedentary lifestyle, then you probably have bradycardia and you should go see a doctor right away. <laughs> if you have a heart rate that's in the 80s, even upper 70s or in the 70s, I would definitely say go see a doctor. If it's in the 80s, see a doctor right away because there could be a huge problem there and you may not even be aware otherwise until a heart attack or a stroke and by then it could be too late. So go see a doctor. So my case, I'll use me for example, mine is in the upper 40s. It's been as low as 44, but it's not Brady for me because I'm super fit. I've been working out hard for, gosh, quite a few years now, like 16, 17 years, something like that. So I've just driven it down in a, a healthy way. And there's some athletes where they've, um, like super elite athletes, uh, ultra marathon runners and things like that, theirs can be as low as like I think I've heard cases of 38 or 39 where it's still not considered bradycardia, like it's not a problem. Now, the reason why this is so healthy to drive it down low, like into the 40s, in a, as a result of being fit, is because your heart nourishes the rest of your body with each pump. It drives blood, oxygenated blood, and nourishes everything. Well, sometimes the nourisher needs nourishing. And the only time your heart aka the nourisher, is nourishing itself and repairing itself, is in between beats. So if you, if you have a low heart rate in a healthy way, your heart has that much more time to heal and repair itself and nourish itself. If you have a very fast heartbeat, your heart has no time or, or not enough time to nourish itself, so then you run into heart problems, heart diseases, as you get older and that leads to medications, it leads to a life that doesn't feel as comfortable. So you really want to, you know, that's where fitness really comes into play as well as diet, but especially fitness, if you want to bring your heart rate down into like the lower 50s or somewhere in the 40s, it comes down to fitness as well as eating a good, healthy, plant-based, nutrient-dense diet. And then your heart's going to have more time to repair itself. The nourisher can be nourished. And that just makes the rest of your body happy, which makes your brain happy, makes you happier. So it's, it's worthwhile to do both exercise and nutrition and getting a good night's sleep every night and not stressing about anything because all those are extremely important variables. They all interact with one another, okay? So that's why resting heart rate is so important. And that's how it intertwines with blood pressure where you got the top number systolic and the bottom number in a blood pressure reading diastolic, the pressure against your vessels when your heart is in the middle of a beat and then the pressure when your heart is between beats and that time between beats is when your heart is nourishing itself. The nourish, the nourisher becomes nourished. Okay, so that's the first two items. Get this, I recommend every household had ones. Just, just know where you're at, you know? You wanna know where you're at. And if you need to see a doctor, you're gonna wanna know versus a rude awakening, you wake up in the morning and poof, you had a stroke or something. Okay, so the next item is gonna be uh, a blood glucose monitor. Typically you can get it in a pouch like this and it's gonna have the actual reading. It's gonna have the little testing strips, which looks like it's gonna come typically a tube like this and they look something like this. Now, I'm not going to show you how to use this device in this video because that would take too long and I want to stay on point. And there's also the little lancets. They come with the little plastic thing. You twist it off and you put it in this device here. It's spring-loaded. And you push the button and put it on your finger and it pricks you. And then you get the little drop, little drop of the blood, put it on the strip. Then you put it in this thing and it gives you a reading. So with this device, it's going to give you a reading, um, people call it points, but it's really milligrams per deciliter. That's what it is technically, medically. So ideally, you want it to be when you first wake up in the morning before you eat or drink anything other than water. Anything other than water is going to raise your blood sugar. And when you do this test, you want to do it uh, when you first wake up before you've had anything that could raise your blood sugar level. 
you want it to be below 90. Like somewhere in the 80s is pretty ideal. Mine is typically about 88, 87, 88, 89, somewhere in there. So that's pretty good. That's pretty ideal. That's optimal health. If you start to get into the 90s, then you're on your way to becoming a pre-diabetic. And if you don't change a lifestyle at that point, then it's eminent. You will become a diabetic. So if you do this test and you find out that you're above 90, I recommend changing your diet, changing something, exercise more, combination of both, stress less, maybe your stress up, out of control except raises blood sugar too, damages the pancreas. The pancreas is what releases insulin and glucagon, which regulates blood sugar. And you want your pancreas organ to be optimally functioning and stress really gets in the way of that. So you gotta find a way to manage or reduce stress, eat better, more plant-based diet, and exercise too, because exercise burns glucose, burns blood sugar. So a combination of all those things. And, and good sleep too, if you don't get enough sleep, that's gonna cause problems as well. So people that have type two diabetes, that's typically done if you have uh, a reading of 110 milligrams per deciliter or above on two separate occasions, as well as an A16 reading of 6.0 or above. I think they go more like 6.5 or something like that, but optimally you want an A16 reading of below 6.0. And the only way to get that done is at a doctor's office. I'm not aware of a way to do that at home, but odds are if your blood sugar is fine, it's below 90, somewhere in the 80s when you first wake up before eating or drinking anything, then your A1C is probably pretty good. But if it is up there, I would go see a doctor, I would change something about your lifestyle, you may want to get an A16 test done. An A16 test basically takes an average of um, the past six months. And so if you have a blood sugar that's 110 or above and your A1C reading is above six or above 6.5, you're probably going to get a diabetes diagnosis, if not prediabetes. But most likely at that point, you're beyond prediabetes, you're probably diabetic, type two. So the best thing you can do is prevent it. And if you're already there, especially if it's type two, you know, you can reverse it. Odds are extremely favorable. You can reverse it. People have done it just by lifestyle changes and so on. But if you need medical treatment in the meantime, you know, listen to your doctor and, and be safe. Okay, so the next thing, uh, I don't have this, and maybe somebody will get one, but it's called a pulse oximeter. It's just a little bitty device that clips onto your finger. It's non-intrusive, it's, it's super simple. And it just, uh, it reads your oxygen saturation in your blood. It should be somewhere between 95 and 100. I would argue 97, 98, 99, 100. I think 95 is a little low to be honest, unless you're in the midst of vigorous anaerobic activity. It should be definitely in the upper 90s, up to, up to 100%. So with that, uh, if you dip down into the lower 90s, go see a doctor. If you're in the 80s, oh God, go see a doctor. I mean, you're gonna know if it's in the 80s because you're not gonna feel good. Your energy is gonna suck. Typically people that have a low pulse oximeter reading, a low oxygen saturation, these are people who have smoked cigarettes for a very long time and maybe they're, they're not used to getting any exercise or kind of sedentary. And so the, they're just not getting the oxygen required in their blood to, for their body to feel good and to operate well. Uh, that person is probably also on oxygen. If it's gotten that bad, it's somewhere in the upper 80s. They are most likely on oxygen as it is. And if they're not, they should be because they will feel so much better. But don't let it get that bad. Quit smoking. Please quit smoking. You eat a better diet and get some exercise and uh, get that oxygen in, in your blood. Get those oxygen saturation readings back up to a good level because the oxygen in your blood, you feel that instantly. It doesn't take time. It might take time to bring it back to where it should be, but as your oxygen improves in your blood, you feel that instantly. And as it gets worse, you feel that instantly. So a pulse oximeter thing could be handy, but odds are, I mean, if your energy feels okay and you're not a, a chronic smoker, then you probably don't need, especially if all these other readings are good, your resting heart rate, your blood glucose level with the milligrams per deciliter and your millimeters per mercury with the blood pressure reading, if all those things are good, I wouldn't worry about getting a pulse oximeter. 
they're really inexpensive, so it's no big deal if you do, and you might just be curious. So yeah, go ahead and get one. I don't even have one. Maybe someday, well, just out of curiosity, who knows? So there's other things um, that you can only get from a doctor's office, which are incredibly valuable. And that would be, you know, the stuff I've shown you here go a long way towards identifying a problem and addressing it before it becomes a problem that gets in the way of your life and affects you in a very bad way. So, you know, it's like a canary in the coal mine. You recognize something before it becomes a real problem and you, and you nip it in the bud. You know, the stuff goes a long way towards that. So get these items. Also, if something is way out of control, like your blood sugar is super high, your, <clears throat> your uh, resting heart rate is super high, or your blood pressure reading is super high, then you need to go see a doctor right away and get that taken care of, get that looked at. However, if all these readings are great, your blood glucose is below 90, your blood pressure is 120 over 80 or better, your resting heart rate is in the 50s or, or 40s or something like that. Odds are extremely favorable that your blood panels are going to be fine, uh, that your C-reactive protein analysis levels, which measures inflammation in the body, that's probably doing pretty good. But the only way you'll know those things for sure is you go to a doctor and you have a full comprehensive blood panel done that measures all those things. So I'm not talking about medical treatment here. This is just screening, it's uh, observing, it's maybe a diagnosis if there's something going on. But you can take a full comprehensive blood panel, take those different tests, those different readings and screenings, and if you want to, take it to a holistic practitioner, a naturopathic doctor, and show that person those things. And if there is something going on, if you're low in a particular vitamin or whatever, there's an inflammation issue that's a little bit high, then a holistic practitioner or a naturopathic doctor they can be like, okay, so here's some natural remedies we can do to address these items. But if there is something that shows up that is acutely very bad, like an emergency situation, you could drop out of a heart attack or a stroke any day, even if you feel fine right now, but your levels are so out of control, then man, you need to get medical treatment instantly and uh, see the naturopathic doctor once that's under control and you are no longer in imminent danger then go see the naturopathic doctor with those readings and with those levels and and get that taken care of so you, so you nip it in the butt at the root source so it doesn't pop back up again and you'll feel a lot better. So getting those readings done, blood panels and measurements of inflammation in the body, the C-reactive protein analysis, those are things that even from a holistic point of view are extremely valuable from the medical community. So I do recommend those things. But if all of these things look good, blood pressure, I can't reiterate it enough, man. Blood pressure, your blood, blood glucose levels, your resting heart rate, and if you get a pulse oximeter, your oxygen saturation, odds are extremely favorable. Your, your blood panels are going to be fine. Your um, C-reactive protein analysis that measures inflammation, that's probably going to be fine, especially if you're a young person, say below the age of 30 or below the age of 35. Uh, odds are you're probably gonna you're gonna be okay if you get all those things done. But if you want to get those done anyway, just you know talk to your doctor about getting all that stuff done. It could just be because because I want to know, you know, because I want to know. Or if something is off with one of these things that you're doing, you've gotta let your doctor know and be like, yeah, what do we do, doc? And then your doctor might be like, yeah, let's get some blood work done. Let's do this and that. And then you can take that stuff to a naturopathic doctor, also following your doctor's advice at the same time. And just sort of you know play it by ear that way. So in closing, I cannot recommend enough. This could save your life. It could save the life of somebody in your household. You should know what your blood pressure is. You should know what your blood glucose levels are. And you should know what your resting heart rate is. And beyond that, I'd say if you're a smoker, definitely get a pulse oximeter device. They're very inexpensive, non-intrusive. That's no big deal. Like instantly, it'll measure your oxygen oxygen saturation there and uh, between all those things you know that really goes a long way it's going to go a long way towards helping you prevent uh, a chronic problem or a sudden acute heart attack or a stroke or if you've already got some illnesses happening some chronic issues like diabetes or just general inflammation it's very possible that you could reverse that and heal from that and again i give you nothing to undermine 
any treatment or advice you might be getting from your doctor. I'm a lay person. I love sharing stuff. It's up to you to take action and be safe. So feel free to share this video. And I have my website too, orgasmicpathways.com. That's orgasmicpathways.com. I've got all kinds of healthy recipes in there, healthy grocery lists, all kinds of workouts you can follow along with. And it's all free. It's all free. I don't charge for it. Lots of tips and tricks and lots of very detailed, comprehensive stuff and conceptual stuff and how-to stuff and just endless. I've been building it since like 2011, I think, something like that. So I got thousands of pieces of content in there. I could probably go a long way towards helping you out or if you want to share it with other people, please do. Just get it out there. That concludes today's videos. 21 minutes in, typically the longer videos, I'm like, if you made it to the end, let me know because it always just tickles me when someone makes it to the end. I love that, love it so much. Bye for now, everybody. Take care of your health. I will end with my one of my favorite philosophies. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Love that. Oh, and I'll end on another one of my favorite philosophies. Uh, you're going to pay the organic farmers or you're going to pay the hospitals. You choose. Granted, that's an oversimplified philosophy that deserves lots of nuance, but you get the overall general meaning there. It's, it's a pretty good one. I like it. Oh, one more. Oh, how does this one go? You either got to make time for exercise or you'll be forced to have time for illness at some future point. Again, oversimplified, but you get the general meaning and it's pretty valuable. So run with that. Run with those ideas. And bye for now. Mwah.